Greetings and welcome everyone. I'm Nicola Dyer, Senior Advisor and Secretariat Manager of the Global Seaweed Coalition. It's my pleasure to guide this conversation today. On behalf of the coalition, I'm truly delighted to welcome you all to this webinar on best practice recommendations for sustainable and safe seaweed farming. A couple of quick housekeeping details before we get into the substance of the event. Please feel free to let us know who you are and your institutional affiliation by posting in the chat. And even though by now we're all familiar with Zoom meetings, a gentle reminder to please stay muted unless called upon. Throughout, please feel free to post questions or comments in the chat. Our speakers may respond directly to some of your questions in the chat, or we might cover those in the Q&A. Our team will be monitoring the chat and helping us to manage the conversation flow. And speaking of the team, let me introduce those team members now. First, Sophia, our project coordinator, who's led the coordination of this event. She's waving. Azadine, our communications manager. Hello, who everyone. Said hello. Manny, our scientific officer, who is waving and Andrea, our communications intern, who is also waving. And now, a few quick words about the Global Seaweed Coalition. We're a global partnership whose mission is to support the safe and sustainable scale up of the seaweed sector grounded in science. We do that through our four action pillars, funding, advocacy, science and technology, and policy. We provide seed funding for projects, we spread the seaweed narrative in global, national, and local forums. We share knowledge about scientific and technical, technological developments and good practices in the industry, like today. And we drive and influence policy change from local to global levels. Our members represent the entire seaweed value chain, from smallholder farmers to multinational businesses, specialized research institutes to intergovernmental organizations and many in between, working together to realize the full potential of the seaweed sector and to ensure its safety for consumers, workers, and the environment. The coalition was launched in March, 2021 as the Safe Seaweed Coalition with initial funding of three million pounds from Lloyd's Register Foundation and support from the French National Research Center and United Nations Global Compact, which now houses the coalition. So far, we've delivered 1.1 million euros through two competitive calls for proposals. And our third call is underway right now. It will be open for applications until the 20th of January, 2024. If you have any questions related to this call, please check our website or contact our scientific officer, Melanie. Now, turning to our event. This two hour webinar kicks off ambitious work on developing standards for safe and sustainable seaweed farming with a focus on the needs of smallholder farmers. As seaweed farming expands globally, having a shared set of best practices can help us ensure that all stakeholders have a common agreement on sustainability and quality standards. Such standards and guidelines can contribute to environmental preservation, maintain consistent product quality, boost economic resilience, and enhance transparency in the supply chain. Standardizing practices can help harmonize global regulations, uphold social and worker rights, and foster consumer trust. Best practices that are accepted by the industry could also promote adaptability in this rapidly evolving sector, allowing for more seamless integration of emerging technologies and methodologies. Current international standards are mostly focused on large international businesses, and don't address the needs of smallholder entrepreneurs. The objective of this work being kicked off with this webinar today is ultimately to create standards suitable for small businesses with financial means. These standards would target smallholders in emerging countries with simple operations or family businesses. If well-designed, these new standards would cover most seaweed production and would complement rather than compete with existing standards. This ambitious work is crucial for the safe and sustainable scale up of the sector. 
Let me take you through the agenda of today's event. We'll begin with opening remarks by Ms. Leticia Carvalho, head of the Marine and Freshwater Branch of the UN Environment Program. We'll then hear from six distinguished speakers who'll provide perspectives on seaweed standards from their respective vantage points. Then at the top of the hour, we'll have about 45 minutes for a Q&A. Please be ready with questions for our speakers. Then my colleague Vincent Dumézel will summarize the meeting and share more details on next steps in the process of preparing the report. Finally, I'll come back for a quick closing. Time for the main event. We are truly delighted to welcome Leticia Carvalho. Leticia is an international civil servant, Brazilian oceanographer, and policymaker with over 20 years of experience in environmental governance, sustainable development, and multilateral negotiations. During her time at the United Nations Environment Program, or UNEP for short, she's led historic policymaking on plastic pollution. She's mainstreamed ocean and freshwater ecosystem-based management into the relevant global and regional multilateral environmental agreements, or MEAs, and governance arrangements, and spearheaded ocean literacy and advocacy across UNEP and its member states. She's also a member of the Global Seaweed Coalition's Strategic Advisory Council. Leticia, the floor is yours. Thanks, my dear Nicola. And I, I, I start with a smile because actually, as you mentioned, I am a proud member of this coalition. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and distinguished experts, I can see also good friends, Jaime now and others uh, that I can see in the panel. I'm pleased to deliver this opening remarks addressing a matter of profound significance today. Seaweed farming is booming and in this but in industry, we see an exciting prospect to mitigate climate change, foster environmental resilience, and bolster local communities. The United Nations Environment Program, UNAP, that I have presented here, here recognized the escalating world world interest in seaweed farming as a potential beacon in our quest for scalable ocean-based solutions to climate change. The study seen to suggest that the seaweed aquaculture has the potential to sequester larger amounts of carbon dioxide. While estimates range widely, figures are high as 3.5 tons of sequestered carbon per hectare of seaweed farm predicts exciting possibilities. From demonstrating significant efficacy in reducing methane production when fed to ruminant livestock, to its use as a sustainable bioplastic, to its viability as a third generation biofuel feedstock, it seems the abilities of seaweed are only limited by our own imagination. However, while I enthusiastically say these words, we must take this moment to remind ourselves of the need to measure our optimism with a precautionary approach. For the world is rife with good intentions gone wrong. Importantly, this means that we all need to work together with the scientific community, thought leaders and global initiatives to chart a safe and sustainable pathway guided by well-reasoned best practices and sustainability guidelines that ensure that climate solutions do not harm nature. Just a few months ago in June 2023, UNAP unveiled its technical report titled Seaweed Farming, assessment on the potential of sustainable upscaling for climate communities and the planet. So this comprehensive report constitutes an in-depth exploration of the scientific lands landscape surrounding seaweed farming, not only offering a meticulous literature review, but also providing a situational analysis assessing the potential for the sustainable expansion of seaweed farming. This endeavor is rooted in the pursuit of maximizing climate benefits while minimizing environmental and social risks. Crucially, one of the pivotal conclusions, pivotal conclusions that the literature highlights is that fostering global partnerships while collaborating with global coastal communities is an indispensable strategy for safe safeguarding our environment. This collaborative approach is likely a key determinant in realizing climate and environmental co-benefits. It is through these partnerships that we can contribute significantly to sustainable upscaling of seaweed farming 
an endeavor that carries the potential to revolutionize our approach to aquaculture. Moreover, I'm proud to share that UNEP's marine and freshwater work has been at the forefront of this transformative initiative, as we have been building momentum to move in lockstep with the Global Seaweed Coalition. Our commitment is underscored by significant investments of time and resources into researching for sustainable upscaling of seaweed farming and building international sustainable and quality standards for the industry together. Today, we reaffirm our dedication to support initiatives that will not only ensure social economic prosperity, but also safeguard our environment, striving towards an harmonious coexistence between humanity and the planet we call home. As we delve into today's discussions, let us collectively reflect on the potential of seaweed farming as a catalytic for positive change, critically grounded in gender empowerment and informed by the knowledge and the wisdom, I love this part, of the indigenous and local voices, while asking critical and challenging questions. Through collaboration, research, and shared commitment, we embark on a journey that promises not only a sustainable future for our ocean and our coasts, but also a resilient and climate smart approach to aquaculture. Thank you for joining us in this critical dialogue and for your shared dedication to a more sustainable and prosperous planet. And Nicola, uh, it's amazing the space you were giving to the topic and to all of us to come and step in uh, for this topic. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leticia, for that important framing. And the Global Seaweed Coalition is truly delighted to walk this path with, with UNEP. It's very important. Thanks for, for um, setting the tone for this event, for your enthusiasm, but also that call for let's temper our enthusiasm. Let's make sure that it's grounded in reality and the realities that your work at UNEP have, have been able to bring to light through that terrific report on uh, how to scale up sustainably. So with that framing, Thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to continuing, again, to walk that path together, that collaboration. And now uh, we're going to turn to our first speaker. It is my pleasure to turn to Mr. Raul Socrates Benzuela, or SOC. SOC is a community organizer by profession. In a career spanning 41 years, he's helped set up manage and lead several social, environmental, political, economic, cultural, and professional movements and institutions. And he's been involved in waging direct action campaigns in pursuit of asset reforms and good governance in the Philippines. For the past 16 years, he's been the national coordinator of Pakisama, which is a national family farmers confederation that received the 2015 ASEAN Rural Leadership Award. Sok is also a member of the Global Seaweed Coalition's Strategic Advisory Council, and I've been privileged to work with him in the context of not one but two global partnerships and to see firsthand his commitment to ensuring meaningful smallholder engagement and empowerment. Sok, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone here. No. First, I would like to congratulate the Global Seafood Alliance for coming up with the best aquaculture practices, seaweed farm standard. The concern for social accountability, which includes property rights and regulatory compliance, local community relations and worker safety and employee relations. The concern for environmental responsibility, which includes carrying capacity, stocking sources, preservation of wild stocks, genetic diversity and non-native species, biosecurity and disease and pest management, cultivation, site interactions and wildlife interactions, and storage and waste disposal. The concern for food safety, which includes control of potential food safety hazards, and the concern for traceability, which includes record keeping requirements are, I think, universal concerns that need to be laid down as unifying parameters for all stakeholders in the booming seaweed industry, including most of 6 million smallholders, especially those producing 97% of global seaweeds in the world, such as those in China, Indonesia, South Korea, and the Philippines. 
we need to have global standards that would incentivize these values. Second, I would like to note, however, that while standard setting is always a loadable venture, we may also need to note possible unintended consequences in the transition. In November 17, 2016, the National Organic Standards Board in the U.S. delisted Karajinan in its first in, in, in its list of products approved for use as organic food. This decision brought down the price of seaweeds in the Philippines by 20 to 30 percent, affecting 200,000 farm families and the 175,000 other jobs related to the seaweed industry. Given this experience in the Seaweed Roadmap 2022 to 2026 crafted by the Philippine government, the uh, ASC certification is considered more a threat than an opportunity. For now, there is fear. Uh, there is fear that the Philippines may lose the European Karajinan market if the standards is mainstream and most Philippine farms are considered non-compliant. Thirdly, this does not mean that we should lower our standard, far from it. What we need is to address the challenges facing smallholders, paramount among which is organizational management capacity to reach out and provide full value chain services to mostly unorganized seaweed farmers. Most farmers are not even a member of any organization, uh, more so uh, uh, more qualitative, professionally managed, managed organization. Second is transitioning most of the current monoculture farms into integrated multi-tropic aquaculture farms or polyculture. Third, they need to improve their participation in the entire value chain beyond production to go into processing and marketing of various food, feed, fuel, and other seaweed products. All these require policy reforms or legislations and capacity building that would include incentivizing the deployment of thousands of professionals in the management staff of cooperatives of seaweed family farmers. Finally, the standard may need to be understood well and owned by the smallholders themselves as a set of parameter, as a set of performance indicators they need to measure their growth with if they want to capture bigger and sustainable local and international markets for their various products. It is in this context that while third party certification may be imperative in, in the international market, most smallholders and their cooperatives who would directly market locally and diversify their products to cater to domestic market may not need expensive international certification. Perhaps we may want to initiate a type of a participatory guarantee system for seaweed products, like the one being advocated by the IFOAM or the International Federation of Organic uh, Agriculture Movement which may be more cost effective and engaging of local stakeholders, especially the smallholders, aligned to the FAO technical guidelines for aquaculture certification. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sok. Thank you so much for so eloquently setting the stage and for pro providing that important reality check for us all. So whether the speakers address this in their prepared, uh, their prepared statements, or whether we come back to some of what you've said in the Q&A, you really laid out some important truths. Thank you very much. Now, we're going to turn to our second speaker, Dr. Nada Bugus. Nada is a fishery officer at the value chain development team in FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization's Fisheries and Aquaculture Division. With more than 16 years of experience in the fisheries and aquaculture sector, Nada has been working on value chain development, marketing and trade, post-harvest post issues, eco-labeling, certification, and traceability. Nada, we look forward to hearing FAO's perspectives. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for the 
<clears throat> for the introduction and uh, to the Global Seaweed uh, Coalition for the kind uh, invitation. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, I hope that you see my screen now. Yes, perfect. Um, it's a really interesting webinar and I look forward to the rest of it and what comes out and the, the follow-up uh, action. I'll be happy to be engaged. Um, I was asked to uh, present on the FAO uh, guidelines on aquaculture certification, but uh, I felt the need to also address some uh, novelties um, and also some capacity building and technical assistance that FAO uh, has been doing. So, sorry, I don't know what's wrong with this. Yes. Okay, so first, while safety and quality are of primary concern, of course, uh, consumers uh, in developed and emerging economies have been increasingly interested in the social and uh, environmental impacts of the food they consume. And this webinar is an example of, of these concerns. Um, this trend is also starting to, make, to take hold in emerging economies and uh, developing countries. In terms of uh, fish and seafood, this means that more and more consumers are concerned that the stocks are uh, managed sustainably, be it for fish, seafood, uh, or uh, seaweed, and that wider ecosystems uh, and related plant and animal life are protected and the social responsibility is exercised throughout the value chain from production uh, through to uh, distribution. Private standards um, and certification have been on the agenda of the FAO subcommittee in fish trade since a long time ago, from 2005, 2006. Um, and this, uh, this was the initiation of the development of the various uh, guidelines uh, on marine capture fisheries adopted in 2005 and then revised in 2009, the inland uh, capture fisheries equilibrium uh, guidelines adopted in uh, 2011. For the aquaculture part, uh, the aquaculture uh, certification uh, guidelines that were adopted in 2011 and uh, most uh, recently the guidelines for sustainable aquaculture that are still uh, in drafts um, that aim at uh, providing a clear direction for the development of sustainable aquaculture and to identify concrete actions uh, to be implemented. So a bit on, on the content um, of, the, of the guidelines. The guidelines state um, that any equilibrium scheme should be consistent with uh, relevant international law and agreements, including UNCLOS, the FAO Code of Conduct on Responsible Fisheries, and the World Trade Organization WTO rules and mechanisms. And uh, they should be voluntary, uh, market-driven, transparent, and non-discriminatory, including by recognizing the special conditions applied to developing countries and small-scale uh, fisheries and aquaculture. The guidelines on marine uh, capture fisheries and also the inland um, uh, inland fisheries were adopted, uh, as I mentioned, 2005, revised 2009, and contain uh, three main sections, the general principles and definitions, minimum substantive requirements and criteria, and procedural and institutional um, aspects. Maybe I'll just mention very briefly, briefly the minimum substantive requirements and criteria that the fishery is conducted under a management system that is based on good uh, practice, including the collection of adequate data on the current state and trends of the stocks. Um, and the stock under consideration is not overfished. The adverse impacts of the fishery on the ecosystem are properly assessed and effectively uh, addressed. Um, because they were developed and uh, endorsed a long time ago, there is no specific um, section on seaweed, but we can interpret because the, uh, the blocks there um, are comprehensive um, enough. 
for the ones um, on uh, aquaculture and similarly, uh, these guidelines uh, follow more or less the same structure uh, with minimum substantive criteria covering animal health and welfare, food safety and quality, environmental integrity, social uh, responsibility, and of course, procedural requirements uh, that cover various aspects from governance to accreditation to uh, certification. Uh, we all know, maybe I will not expand uh, on this because FAO does not certify. We provide, uh, we develop normative work on the basis of our members' uh, recommendations and uh, and man mandates that we, we get. Uh, the confusion that was created with all these uh, label, eco labels and certification schemes, it was necessary to have a global platform uh, and partnership um, that is based uh, on the Code of Conduct of Responsible Fisheries, the various uh, guidelines and other instruments. And that transpired into uh, the GSSI uh, benchmark tool. Here, I'm mentioning here the performance areas, essential components uh, contained in the benchmark tool, but I, I understand that the, there was a revision in 2021 where those was were um, reduced the, between the essential and the, the supplementary to make it easier and uh, more streamlined. Now on uh, the guidelines on for sustainable uh, aquaculture, the work as started uh, a while back in 2017. We were, if it was requested uh, by members at the subcommittee on aquaculture uh, to identify successful initiatives uh, in support of sustainable aquaculture and their documentation and also to compile these into uh, guidelines for sustainable uh, aquaculture towards better implementation of the code of conduct, um, the SDGs, um, and, and to have a, a more sustainable aquaculture sector. The guidelines are still in development. They were endorsed by the FAO subcommittee on fish trade in May this year, and they have to go to the bigger fisheries committee that will be held uh, next year, I believe in, in July. Uh, so it, here is just an indication of the, the content that might be changed for the final uh, version. So the main aim is to provide a clear uh, direction for the development of sustainable aquaculture and identify the concrete actions that need to be implemented uh, for aquaculture to best contribute to food security, poverty alleviation, preservation of ecosystems and biodiversity, and the broader goals of the 2020 Agenda for Sustainable um, Development. These guidelines, of course, um, recognize the important linkages between aquaculture and other sectors, such as fisheries, agriculture, forestry, wildlife, coastal and marine uh, tourism, energy production, mining, and uh, transportation. Like the, the other guidelines, they're voluntary. Uh, they have a global scope and should be adapted to apply to aquaculture in its varied context, system scale, uh, farm species types, uh, environments, and um, activities. And here, uh, slightly different from the other uh, guidelines, uh, we'll see for the final version if this would be kept, but it was uh, an important component to keep in terms of implementation and monitoring, and for the, the document to be uh, a live one with the recurrent uh, revisions and practical, that was one of the most important um, uh, criteria. Here, I would like to conclude uh, with some of what FAO uh, has been uh, doing, uh, lots of technical assistance provided through projects to, to countries, either focused on seaweed or on include seaweed uh, development as a component. Uh, work is also included in through the progressive management pathways for improving aquaculture biosecurity in the context of uh, Codex and FAO WTO. Um, there was a background document uh, that was developed uh, for the to provide um, information and feedback uh, to the report of the expert meeting on food safety for seaweed cultures uh, uh, current status and the 
future perspectives. I think it was in 2021 or, or last year. And it's also part of the work on aquatic genetic resources development. Uh, and of course, if it continues to support uh, members and stakeholders to improve the quantity quality of data and information uh, on seaweed uh, and uh, microalgae. Here I included um, a link to a report uh, that has other links to other reports and summarizes some of uh, uh, FAO's uh, projects and uh, some lessons learned. Uh, I can share this uh, with you later on if you would like to disseminate to the various participants. I hope I kept to the five minutes. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the rest of the, of the webinar. Thank you very much, Nada. That was so informative. It tells us we're not starting from scratch. And it's also great to hear that the guidelines are considered to be living and that, uh, that they can evolve. And it will be probably very interesting to hear how FAO's technical support could be to members could be brought to uh, to answer SOC's call for capacity development for smallholders themselves. So, um, so an open space, an evolving space. We're now going to turn to our third speaker, Dan Lee. Dan began his career in the shrimp farming industry in Ecuador in the 1980s. He went on to manage a series of hatchery projects in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. 20 years ago, he started working with uh, what is now known as the Global Seafood Alliance, and most of his work is now related to the development of certification standards and running the best aquaculture practices program. Coming to us from your home in Wales, Dan, over to you. Thank you, Nicola. I'm sharing the screen here. Has that come up? Uh, as intended. It did. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay, so a chance to introduce you to the uh, BAP seaweed farm standard. So I'm very glad to be here. And it's good to hear uh, Sock also mentioned this standard in his talk earlier on. So uh, this document was released in June this year, and it's uh, a new uh, output from uh, GSA, Global Seafood Alliance. We've done multiple standards for fish and crustaceans. And of course, we couldn't ignore the importance of uh, seaweed. So this standard isn't produced. Now we don't have this out as a, an offering for certification as yet, but we do have a, a set of uh, best practices condensed into this document. We created this standard initially with a draft uh, from Andrew Fitzgerald and Andrew Wilmer in the UK. And they used uh, existing BAP standards as a template and started to work towards something that would apply to seaweed. And then we handed that uh, initial draft over to uh, Alan Critchley. And he was uh, appointed to create a committee to advance the standard and also to make sure that it was appropriate globally. So if you look at his committee members here, you'll see a good represent, representation globally and some names. I'm sure you will recognize not a lot of them. And I think even Alan may be on, the, on this uh, webinar today. The process then took us from uh, a technical committee draft to a draft which went out for public com consultation. Those public comments were came in earlier this year, and then we came out with a final version and that was the, uh, the the one which was uh, approved by this committee and by um, the oversight committee at GSA. And these are the main areas that the standard covers. We're looking at social accountability, environmental impacts, and food safety. Uh, social accountability, particularly, are the permits in place? Um, how does the operation uh, interact with the community? Does it preserve existing uh, access rights, for example. And then there's a big section on worker safety and employee relations. For the environment, we're covering so uh, carrying capacity, source of stocking material. Um, these are the items on the list here, um, including wildlife interactions, pest management, and then uh, storage and disposal of uh, waste. Um, the other item there, food safety, that 
does require some attention to potential uh, food safety hazards. The other area of the standard would be traceability, which obviously is an important aspect. So just expanding a little bit on social accountability, first sets of um, aquaculture standards tended to look at environmental impact, but uh, social sustainability obviously being critical, we've expanded this section on social accountability. And this has been hand, this has been um, ordered to the seaweed standard. It's quite detailed, but uh, if these products are looking for market access, then a lot of social issues such as those listed here need to be covered off. We're looking at child labor, uh, hiring practices, wages, benefits, training. So a lot of um, things can go wrong if social conditions are not taken care of. With auditing, this does involve a, a third party process, which means uh, we set standards, but it's the certification bodies and their teams of auditors who go out and uh, run the inspections at the farm level. It's um, those certification bodies with their auditors who make the decision as to whether the standard is being met. So that gives us a level, a level of separation. And we've heard from uh, FAO guidelines that this is the setup that is approved, as in, uh, yeah, the standard setters should not be making decisions on compliance, they just need to set the standards. So checking records, checking uh, storage facilities, uh, in the case of shrimp farms, um, fish farms, which are pic pictured here, checking uh, effluents, checking feed storage, it's a lot of on-site stuff. It's not a, a very simple model, but it does provide assurances that people are looking for. So looking briefly at how this um, certification process can um, raise the game, here's a uh, histogram with um, all the different farms stacked up in a theoretical bell curve. And if you're moving to the right, for lower impacts, and then you set a standard here with a dotted line, you end up with some high-performing farms which won't do anything because they're already above the standard. You have some farms which are performing poorly, they won't do anything because the target is too distant. But there will be some farms uh, closer to the target who will see some value in improving. And then you can end up with a shift in the distribution, so you get a clustering around the standard. So this analysis came from New England Aquarium, and there is evidence that this does indeed happen with uh, certification. So summarizing some of these features of our culture certification, it does rely on a lot of records demonstrating compliance uh, as well as complying. And these third party audits, these are trained individuals. They may be in country, they may come from abroad. They need uh, travel costs, accommodation sometimes. Uh, they have to go a lot of, um, undergo a lot of training and they're often professionals in their own right. So uh, third party auditors are providing a valuable service and they don't necessarily come cheap. And also, if you look at standards, you can have an impression that they might be top down because they're driven by market expectations. So it's often the issues that come to the fore in the marketplace that end up determining what um, is being required at the level of the producer. So this sometimes translates into standards. I think we've already touched on it and it's part of the uh, context of this, this whole discussion, this whole webinar, is that these aren't always suited to uh, smaller family run units. So why would you stick with standards and certification? Well, uh, they are one tool and they've proved their value. They can provide those assurances. So for people who are looking to international markets, they will support this trade. If there's no confidence in seafood, then uh, trade can dry up in, in key products. And then they serve to provide information to consumers and retailers or anybody who's interested, in fact. And then they will help to spread bed practice spread best practice and drive improvements for the uh, environment, for the social uh, conditions, uh, food safety and animal welfare. And although they are not designed to replace legal requirements, and they're always voluntary standards, they can serve to uh, reinforce legal requirements, which are often, well, in some places, they're not very consistently applied. 
So I'm looking forward to the discussion and uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dan, for laying out the title of this event is Best Practices, and you've laid out elements of those best practices, and you've also clearly indicated they're not always suited to smallholders. So this is a challenge for this work going forward. And by the way, we're very happy to see that in your review group, you've got not only Alan Critchley, who's a member of our scientific council, also several other members of our scientific council and several recipients of our financing. So many, many well known to us. And we're going to be hearing shortly from Valeria, who is one of the speakers here, but not quite yet, because we are now going to turn to our fourth speaker, Miki Takada who's worked at the Marine Stewardship Council, now MSC, since 2017. She's been involved in the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, or ASC, slash MSC, seaweed standard since early in its inception. As a standard manager, she actively contributes to the development, review, and implementation of the seaweed standard and guidelines. She also trains auditors, just what we were hearing from, from Dan just now, and assists in capacity building with local partners. Mickey, we look forward to hearing from you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nicola. Hopefully everybody can hear me. And um, unfortunately, I don't have a, a PowerPoint, so I think you're just stuck with um, watching me for six minutes. <laughs> so hello, my name is Mickey Takata, and I wanted to thank the Global Seaweed Coalition um, for this opportunity to speak. It's such an honor to be on a panel with such distinguished panelists. Um, I only I understand I only have five to six minutes to speak today, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, a lot of the introduction I was going to say, I think Nicola already covered. Um, I work for the Marine Stewardship Council um, as a fishery standard manager. I've worked with Patricia Bianchi, who I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with, for the past four years, developing, reviewing, and implementing the seaweed standard and associated guidelines. And as Nicola said, I train auditors and assist in capacity building with local partners. Um, and also, as most of you probably know, the Marine Stewardship Council or the MSC and the Aquaculture Stewardship Council or the ASC developed a joint standard to certify sustainable and responsible seaweed production under a single certification umbrella. The ASC and MSC are both independent, not-for-profit, credible, and science-based standards for sustainable um, and responsible seafood. The ASC sets standards for responsible aquaculture and the MSC sets standards for the sustainable capture of wild seafood. The standard was developed using a participatory process in accordance with the ICL standard setting code with participation from the seaweed industry, NGO stakeholders, and academics. The standard was published in November of 2017 and it came into effect in March of 2018. And next I wanted to briefly touch on how the program works. Um, in our program, seaweed production units volunteer to be assessed against the ASC and MSC seaweed standard. It's a third party, um, it's the third party independent certifiers, much like Dan said in the previous presentation, that conduct the assessments, not the ASC or the MSC, and they are supported by a team of experts using the process outlined in our standard. And once a seaweed production unit is certified, um, companies in the supply chain um, apply for a chain of custody or COC certification. Products packed by COC certified companies can use the ASC or MSC equal label. And traceability is key for both the ASC and the MSC, so you can view all reports relating to the production unit certification on the ASC's website. As far as um, scope is concerned, um, the ASC MSC seaweed standard applies to all algae or seaweed species, um, whether that's microalgae or macroalgae, and it can apply to both marine or freshwater algae species. The standard applies globally to all locations in the world and all scales of operation, big to small, and um, is for harvest of wild stocks as well as um, aquaculture systems. Our seaweed standard covers all types of operations, and you can use the ASC or MSC label depending on what type of operation it is. Um, as you know, some seaweed is truly wild, while some is enhanced, and some is true farming, so our standard covers all of these types of operations. Now getting into the actual seaweed standard, there are five principles or areas that are assessed. Principle one looks at the sustainability of the wild population. Principle two looks at the environmental impacts. So things like the impact that the seaweed production unit has on other species, the surrounding habitat or the environment um, or the ecosystem, as well as how they engage in waste management, 
pollution control and energy efficiency. I think this is very similar to what Dan talked about in the previous presentation. Principle three ensures that there's effective management while principle four assesses whether the seaweed production unit is socially responsible. So it, it looks at things like whether there's child labor, forced bonded or compulsory labor, whether there's discrimination, whether workers are paid a, for a fair and decent wage, and whether there's freedom of association and collective bargaining. And lastly, principle five looks at community relations and the interactions between the seaweed production unit and the community um, surrounding it. Each of these principles have to meet a certain level before the production unit can be certified. Last but not least, I wanted to touch on the MSC ASC seaweed standard as it relates to the inclusive um, standard accommodating the needs and resources of smallholder farms. Um, I believe that's the focus of our conversation today. So currently there are 46 farms certified against the MSC ASC st seaweed standard and those farms are in South Korea, Japan and the United States. Many are family farms with family members helping with seedling, harvesting and processing. And many of these farms process less than 10 tons per year. Most of the certified production units produce macroalgae like wakame, kombu, hijiki, arame, and nori, although we have a few that produce microalgae such as euglena and chlorella. We also offer group certification and we do in fact have one group certified in Japan um, which produces wakame and kombu. In addition, we have special requirements for family-based production units based on FAO criteria and micro family businesses can be exempt from some of the social and community relations related requirements. If they have challenges obtaining quantitative data, they can also use qualitative data instead. So as you can hopefully see, the ASC MSC seaweed standard is robust and credible and covers most of the environmental and social issues we face today. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for letting us participate and engage in this um, very important dialogue um, and for allowing us to discuss our standard and to introduce the methodologies we form for the small scale seaweed operations in our program. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mickey. It's really good to hear about uh, about your standards and also about where where things stand, particularly with respect to some of the big uh, the big developed countries and the way that the standards are being applied. It will be interesting, perhaps as the work progresses, to see how all of these standards fit together and to see what is needed. This is part of the work that's kicking off. What's needed to uh, make adaptations to the guidelines potentially, or to support the smallholder farmers, particularly in emerging economies to help them to meet those guidelines. With that, now let's turn to our fifth speaker, Ms. Mina Epps. Mina is, is, works as Global Director for IUCN Oceans. IUCN is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Mina has over 20 years of experience in international environmental work, from field work in Madagascar to policy work now in Geneva. Mina, please, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicola. It's really my pleasure to be here with you today. So it's been really exciting uh, thus far. So as you said, I work for IUCN. Uh, so we are best known for kind of the protection and restoration and the definition of marine protected areas and their categorization. So we've been working uh, the last few years and trying to look at how can you reconsolidate marine protected areas and aquaculture. Um, etc. So today I will be talking a little bit about our nature-based, uh, a global standard for nature-based solutions. So again, many thanks for the invitation to speak here. Also very happy to see friends and former colleagues from the MSC, but also Leticia. So with that, I, I would like to show you a few, just a few slides, if that works. Uh, and let's see how we're doing. I'm going for a screen two. Let's see. If that works. It's sharing your blank Zoom screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. I just have too many screens. I just have to share that. So I am now going to put it on. Can you all see that? Perfect. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to talk about the global standard for nature-based solutions and aquaculture. So first, if we look at what is the definition of nature-based solutions? It's basically defined as 
actions to protect, restore, and sustainably manage naturally and modified ecosystem, which addresses challenges effectively and adaptively, while simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So this concept or standard is not this definition, it, it's and the concept is not something new per se. This is actually builds on decades of work. Um, I think it's important to distinguish. Um, do you see the the let me see how do I do that? Like that? Okay. So the actual standard was developed from by eight more than 800 contributors from different experts group over a two-year period but a lot of public consultation uh, and also with the user group. It has, the aim is really to address the environmental and societal challenges that we face today and addressing them. And I think main important thing here is really to see that nature-based solutions are different from nature-derived solution or even nature-inspired, right? For example, wind or offshore energy, which is maybe derived from, from nature, but it's not necessarily a nature-based solutions. So we have eight criteria and 28 indicators for designing and assessing existing and nature-based solutions or uh, projects. is really a benchmarking tool in terms of it's a facilitative standard to support a transitioning to a more inclusive and holistic integrated nature-based solutions approach. So uh, before launching the standard, we have put, piloted in many different regions and it's also been translated into seven languages so far. So here you can see the different criteria, sorry. Um, and as mentioned, you have eight main criteria, but each criteria um, has then a subset of indicators that needs to be addressed. And then you can actually look at what is the adherence of the intervention to each indicator which is rated. And then it gives you an overall output of where the intervention and the adherence of the standard, where it's strong or, or not so strong. Um, so in terms of Aquaculture, I mentioned that we have been working on how do you integrate uh, aquaculture and marine protected areas. So I'm going to give you just a very quick ca case study uh, from uh, seaweed farming in Tanzania. Uh, so this is a, based on a project, Aquacoco, funded by the French uh, Agency for Development and Cooperation. And it's, it was, the intention was not, uh, this was actually, this project was, was launched before we actually had a global standard for nature-based solutions. So we then went back and tried to retrofit this. And I saw there's some from, from Tanzania on the call today. And I'll just say that I was there visiting this farm um, about 10 days ago in Zanzibar. So here you can see the different, um, different uh, eight criterias and, Surprise, and not maybe surprising to some, we can see that this has really been, um, it's not so strong at the, on the biodiversity net gain or balancing the different trade-offs. That's something that, we sh that was discovered when we actually applied this retrospectively. So it kind of tells you a little bit where you need to go. So we are not a standard to really address the practice of aquaculture, as you've heard, there are different standards does that but more on, the, on a holistic point of view. And we all want to move to nature positive economies and societies, uh, and that is a challenge. So you you might score, get an overall low, lower score. It doesn't mean that your operation is unenvironmentally friendly. It's just that we need to really be mindful and address some of those trade-off. For example, I was walking out there in low tide, and of course we all know about climate change, and that was out of the control of those seaweed farmer, but the water temperature was very high, um, especially then at low tide. And, you know, what we could see is also that a lot of the seaweed has been trembled uh, on the, by, by the shore or further in. So that's, you know, a negative trade-off as such, and also a carbon sink lost. So these are just to give you um, an example. So I think I will stop there so we can look, uh, have a bit more of a discussion. And again, if you would like to have you know more information? Um, there is also the where you can contact and follow us uh, on these different channels, and I'm happy to appoint you to different different uh, part of the organization, whether it's assurance or, or, or working directly on more blue economy or on this project in particular. So with that, I will stop sharing. And uh, yes, I'm now back, and I can see you all again. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicola.
Thank you very much, Mina. It's great, especially to see that case study from Tanzania. And indeed, our Scientific Council um, member, Flower Suya was on the call. I think she was having some connection difficulties, but I hope she's been able to stay on this because it will be interesting to hear her perspectives on this, having been at the, you know, being, being the pioneer on the Zanzibar Seaweed Cluster Initiative. Now we turn to our sixth and final speaker panelist, uh, Dr. Valeria Montalescu, uh, who is a seaweed specialist at Cargill. We're getting the private sector perspective now. Valeria is a, a phycologist by training. She's currently leading the Red Seaweed Promise, which is Cargill's program to se secure a sustainable sourcing of red seaweeds. So, you know, a consumer of all of these standards, if you will. So it was my pleasure to meet Valeria recently and hear her speak about the importance of seaweed research at our second annual meeting in October. Valeria, look forward to hearing your perspectives on um, best practices, especially for smallholders. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me today. Uh, so I have a few slides. Let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, do you see it? We do. It's coming. Okay, thank great. Uh, I will try to quickly explain what is this program and what has been our journey in trying to get certifications or at least some standards applied to our sector. So this work started back in 2017 when my predecessors were looking at which sustainability standard could be applied to the Red Sea with production by smallholder farmers in tropical areas. And we didn't find any that was really suitable for these smallholder farmers, right? So we said, okay, let's try to go for our own sustainability. I will not say it's standard, but at least some criteria to verify how we are doing. So we look at Cargill Sustainable Goals, SDGs, other close standards, and we came up uh, in a collaboration with Proforest with a unique sustainability evaluation matrix for smallholders. We did some trials with our suppliers where we assess the performance of the supplier and the producers they are working with. And then from there, we identify gaps and we recommend continuous improvement projects. The theory with the system was to try also to have verified volumes that uh, we could use through a single site global mass balance system. Um, I think here the important point is that uh, at the time, the scale of the other standards that was a farm was not suitable for what we needed to do. So that is the Red Sea with Promise 1.0. The thing, so as you know, is that at least for red tropical seaweed, the value chain is quite complex. You need uh, hundreds of families to come up with 10 tons of pure carrageenan, so it's in the hand of many, many smallholders. The value chain is long. You have smallholders, village collectors, traders, finally the exporters and then us. So long value chain, informal business. But if you look closely at what is going on in this value chain, then you will see that the smallholder farmers are responsible for most of the work, meaning that uh, they are basically on their own to have to uh, find healthy seedlings. They are also the ones who are going to decide where to cultivate and how to cultivate. And that often depends directly on the capital they can invest. And then they also have in charge of the first drying step, which can be very ris risky when there is the rainy season and things like that. And then when you look at exporters, they are going to do the final steps, drying to export standards and packaging. So here we have a very unbalanced value chain and the risk is supported by the most vulnerable. If we keep going on with the cumatoid case, and I'm going to do it quickly, it's seaweeds are very easy to cultivate. Therefore, it's an opportunistic activity. And I think that Sok was touching into it that, uh, by the fact that this is driven also by price volatility. It's an opportunity to, to harvest or to cultivate seaweed. It's very short, 30 to 45 days. If the price is good, you start cultivating. If it's not good, you stop. So it's a cash crop for remote and poor communities. Because it has been easy to cultivate, the consequence is that we have a significant lack of investment on the production over the past decades. And the big consequence of this is that today we have many challenges. Lack of resilient strains, 
for basic and non-efficient practices that are supported by low social and economic resilience um, uh, communities. Then most of the value chain is informal and in unbalanced business network. And finally, if you look at local, national, or international regulatory frameworks, seaweeds and even algae as general are a very strange beast. They don't fit anywhere compared to other crops. So in general, we, we don't have what we need today and the sector is already there. So we have a sector that is way behind in terms of agronomic development, which makes that we have a value chain that is non-resilient against climatic change or social economic shocks. And in Cargill, we want to still be here in 10 years and we want seaweeds to still be here in 10 years and the farmers to too. So when we are looking at what we're doing with this evaluation matrix or, or, or criteria, we were really focusing on our supply base only, meaning that we were looking at the smallholders, the exporters, and that's really just about how to help our suppliers and how to help the smallholders they are working with. But the thing is that we have challenges that are not on the control of the suppliers or the smallholder farmers or even us. So, for us today, the conclusion is that because of the low maturity of the value chain, we cannot think only about verification or certification scheme to guide us to have impactful actions in the ground. So for us, it's not enough to have a sustainable red seaweed. So we just change the scale of our actions. Now we are developing the second version of the red seaweed promise, and we are focusing our actions beyond our value chain meaning that we want to understand better the challenges and the risk of the landscape and the sector. And now we are moving more to a framework where we are going to do our local baselines. And for that, we are going to use methodologies as the social life cycle assessment of the UNEP. And from there, and thanks to other experts, we build theory of change with our local stakeholders, long-term roadmaps, and we commit to long-term efforts, research and development and collaborative approach. So what was yesterday, like the main tool, which was our standard, <laughs> is now today just a tool to help us measure our progress against, I will say, almost other sectors. But we have moved, we have changed the scale. The farm for us at the moment is not the right scale for a certification or standards. It's more the sector, including us. And that's it for you. Thank you, Valeria. That uh, you're a, an actor in the sector. You are on the ground. You're doing the work. Without Cargill, uh, there is there isn't a market for many of the off for many of the smallholders to sell their uh, their products to through that long value chain, as we saw. Now. That concludes the speaker presentation part of our uh, of our webinar. We're now going to turn to the exciting part of Q and A. And since I haven't seen any questions in the chat just yet, I'm sure there are going to be some. I wanted to give the floor to Sok to see whether perhaps after hearing the speakers presenting, Sok, did you have any questions for uh, one of the presenters, one or perhaps two of the presenters? Because we, we're really grateful to have you uh, voicing smallholder concerns directly and to see how those smallholder concerns are, are being reflected or acknowledged, or what distance is to travel just yet. So Sok, any questions for our panelists? Yes, thank you, uh, uh, Nicola. Uh, my question is uh, to Mickey and Dan. Um, my, my question is basically, is there any role for the cooperatives or the associations of the smallholder farmers in the certification process? Because we are uh, practically involved in certifying farms. Uh, but we're talking of here like 6 million farms or hundreds of thousands of farms. And uh, and uh, the role of cooperatives uh, usually has always been to provide aggregation. And uh, so my question is, is there a role for the cooperatives in the certification process? Is there a possibility that uh, we 
we even uh, uh, make full use of, you know, build their capacity of the cooperatives to certify their members, you know, uh, uh, being compliant to the standard we all agree. Um, um, Thanks, so that's Sok. Thanks, Sok. That that's that's a great question. Let me just uh, and come in because that was that was the point Valeria was making. Uh, are you going to certify every farm, or is there an aggregation? So Dan, you wanted to come in, and then we'll go to Mina. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, Sok, thank you. Um, yes, definitely, because um, when there are multiple smallholders individually, they uh, the attaining the standard is uh, is too much of a, a hurdle but we will work with um, agriculture clubs cooperatives associations they do need to have some central management set up so uh, the the model is the, the that central um, management setup needs to be audited and then a sub sample of the individual operators would then be sampled as well and that way you can spread the cost and there's no need for the order to order to visit every single operation. So that model does work, and it's it's certainly is the way to to make these uh, certification schemes accessible. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, uh, Mina, and then I'm guessing Mickey. Are you wanting to answer Sock's question as well? Okay, so we'll turn to Mickey, and then we'll turn to Thierry. And just uh, for everybody, again, we all know Zoom, uh, Zoom uh, protocols and the like. Please do raise your Zoom hand if you'd like to ask a question, as Thierry has so effectively already done. So Thierry, we'll turn to you after we hear from Mina, and then from Mickey. Thanks, Mina. Over to you. Sorry, I did not have a question. Sorry, I just had to for, for one second step, step away. Was there a question for me? Oh dear, yes. Sok was asking you if there's a role for cooperatives for organizing um, smallholders into into larger groups. Yeah. So within the na nature based solutions or within this project. So I think within the project and also a lot of other work we do in the coast. It is certainly we, you have to work with the you know the the, the farmers or the seaweed um, corporation etc at the local level and I think that's really key. So for example, this project is just one of of many sites that I visited, and it was a cooperative of thirty five women. So it's mainly women undertaking this, and it's it's a supplementary income. I I should also be clear about that for this thirty five umo, and I think there's also certain probably improvements that can be made on you know, really looking at, you know, what is the, um, you know, the margin, the profit and the margins, et cetera, to really account for all the materials, but also the time spent, et cetera. So it was really interesting, but that's a cooperative and, and they work uh, together and have been doing for several years. I think now the next thing or the challenges we know is really to adapt to some of these climate change implications. So that means moving a little bit further out so you can actually have it at a deeper level and I think that, you know, that means that, you know, the women have to work further. Another thing that I also did, sorry, going off a different one at Colho, but I think it's important because these these women were extremely proud. It was just an absolutely joy. They, you know, they're independent, they're strong, their voice is heard. I think the challenge um, that comes in is this cooperative is strong, but then there are other cooperative like fisheries cooperative or in tourism. So I think the next key thing to engage in is really the marine spatial planning at the very local level, because, for example, the drying was then further away because they couldn't use, you know, the beach area because of tourism. So, of course, there is that competition for space and there's many different, but definitely, absolutely, is there a space? So that's a long way to say yes, <laughs> a long way to say yes. Thank you for that question. Thanks, Mina. And just to flag for those who haven't seen in the chat, uh, the flower is echoing your point, in fact, saying the local level is really important. Mickey, what would you like to say to this question? Sure. Thank you so much, Nicola. Um, I just, um, a lot of what I had to say kind of mirrors what Dan says. And um, so one of the things we're working on right now is the group certification for the seaweed standard. And so um, um, what Dan said, what, there should be a strong centralized management system in place where um, there's SOPs and um, 
you know, management processes in place. Um, and then it's kind of understood that the the other farms kind of have similar systems in place. Um, so if something happens, they can revert back to that system. And so um, I think there is a way to um, go forward with that sort of group certification. So yes, I, I agree with what Dan said. Uh, thank you. And and just again, drawing attention to Flower's comments in the chat for the certification and standards experts um, to be thinking about why should farmers go to so much effort to clean seaweed? What's in it for them? And while you're thinking about that, let's now hear from Thierry Chopin, who is also a member of our scientific council. Thierry, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Um, yeah, a little background. Um, I have been involved with uh, four standards. Um, people in uh, going back in, the, it was in 2015, the MSCSC uh, standards, and then there was one standards, not too many people talk about it, in 2015, 2017, that was the FMC uh, better management practice for seaweed production, which was done with the New England Aquarium in Boston. And that was mostly geared because of FMC business to red seaweeds in the Philippines and Indonesia. So there is a lot that could be revisited there. Then 2019, I was involved with uh, the Seafood uh, Watch program in Monterey Bay Aquarium. And my here, I was there to tell them there is more than uh, fish here to put in your uh, seafood watch program. You should also think seaweeds. And we have progress. And there is some uh, text now. And then since 2021, of course, the Global Seafood Alliance, the GSA. So what struck me in all of them, uh, in all these uh, four um, standards, it was always going back to the same questions, and I am glad to see we are progressing, is what is the unit of certification? It was always the same thing. Is that a small family farm? Is that a village? Is that a region? Is that the processing? Is that the extracting uh, sectors? It was never clear what is the unit of certification. And then also, of course, something we have to talk is what's the price? What's the cost of certification? And most of the uh, little family unit of uh, a few square meters in a little bay in the Philippines or Indonesia cannot afford certifications. So it has to be at a bigger scale. But I, I think uh, we start uh, uh, to see that discussion happening today. That, that's great. Uh, another thing is um, uh, with nature-based solution. We have to remember that in the case of seaweeds, 97% of the seaweed production in the world is from aquaculture. So technically, it doesn't belong to nature-based solution. <laughs> Aquaculture is something uh, with, a, uh, it's made with seaweeds and all these things, but aquaculture is a man-made solution. It's not a nature-based solution. So we have to address that. And then the last things coming from what I heard today is all these standards, generally it's done by one organization, and of course, they want their name associated with it, the MSC, ASC, the GSC, everybody wants to associate their name with the standards. <clears throat> and then there is a will to have a standard that cover every seaweed. And as a matter of fact, instead of having one organization that wants to do all these vertical things, is that not better to think, as a matter of fact, certification for Ocumatoids in the Philippines and the, uh, uh, Indonesia or Zanzibar is very different from certification of kelp uh, harvesting in uh, Norway, for example. And then one is more technical and one is more social uh, issues and everything, but there is not much in common. So instead of having one standard that cover all the seaweed, should we not be thinking of all these certification bodies getting together and say, we do an ecumatoid standards and it's a joint collaboration of MSC, ASC, GSC, everybody go with their little logos. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and then we do another one for uh, kelp and we do another one for porphyra, uh, por por porphyra. Uh, because 
Each time it's very different cultural practices. Each time it's different issue. In some part of the world, it's more social issues and uh, <clears throat> uh, avoiding uh, children works and all these things. And other place it's, oh, we don't want over harvesting and all these things. So the, the, the issues are very different. Uh, and I am more interested maybe of changing the attitude, one standard for all to several standards for different cultural practices, different social background on organization, certification organization joining instead of having each is a little flag. Thank you very much, Thierry. Um, it, it, yes, indeed, rather than uh, individual organizational flags, uh, can this work lead to um, thinking about how to scale up, whether it's scaling up via the smallholders themselves, whether it's scaling up via the species. And that echoes uh, Raoul's question in the chat, and I see you've got your hand up. I also just wanted to see whether any of our panelists wanted to go to that question, why should a farmer bother? Um, why, why should farmers bother to clean seaweed? So, uh, so Valeria, was that why you have your hand up or did you want to be responding to Thierry? Uh, I can do both if you want, but if you want to hear from Raul first, uh, I can wait. Um, well, let's let's do that. Let's go to you first, and then we'll turn to Raul. Okay. So, yeah, no, for, for that, that's the issue that we have at the moment with the farmers. We we travel twice to Tanzania, twice to Madagascar, twice to Philippines a year, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yes. There is a lot of opportunistic behavior because of price volatility. So I don't know how you can expect that people will commit to better practices when they don't when they don't consider that as a business. Not not perhaps everywhere in Southeast Asia, but I, I, at least in in Africa is the case. So coming back to what Thierry was saying about the scale, that is very important. And what about Sok was saying again? My job will be easy if we had cooperatives, for sure. But it's not the case. Why is not the case? Because price volatility is an issue. And uh, at the moment, you I don't know how you can really move on with inner, inner better practices. And we know what are the better practices. As Thierry was saying, I mean, everyone knows how, how we should be doing it. But just because of this barrier, I don't think it's going to be really possible to, to do it. As one example, we are trying to commit to uh, always purchase at the same price in Tanzania and Madagascar, meaning that we are setting a bottom price that we are not going to move no matter what is going on in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's a trial to see if we can commit to long term with communities. But without that prerequisite, it's almost unthinkable to imagine a long term project with them, be it for product quality or for social projects or even for environmental impacts. So it was just a point about the scale or the context is really important because they don't have always the control. Like the European standards, they are going to be um, assessing companies that have control over what they are being assessed, okay? It's not really the case for smallholder farmers or even for the suppliers. So that was just my point. <laughs> Sorry. And thanks, Valeria. And you bring up an important point, which is that very often what farmers tell us that they need, whether they're uh, aquatic or terrestrial farmers, is they need some help to manage the risks that they face. Typically, they are facing the risks all by themselves. And so having some price stability does help mitigate some of the risks. How you posted a question in the chat about introduced species. Uh, about whether to have standards for those. Is this what you would like to follow up on? You are muted. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yes, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Well, is the I want to uh, probably let you know about the situation that we have in the Caribbean. Uh, in the case of Venezuela, we started seaweed farming maybe in the 80s, and we have like an ups and down. We start with local strains of Gracilaria, and then in 1996, we introduced Capophycus and Eucuma from the Philippines, and we had a nice start, and then suddenly everything about year 2000 stopped due to the lack of regulations about some issues about some environmentalist group about it. It wasn't introduced, and also an invasive. So we went through the whole thing, 
and we start stop everything for 16 years. 2018, we managed to get some partial uh, go from government in Venezuela, and now in less than three years, we're about 2,000 tons dry uh, of farm seaweed. Okay, but still we are trying to convince government, and this is the case of Venezuela, but it's also the case in Colombia, which is they don't want to know anything about introduced species, but Panama he has Capophycus, and Mexico has Capophycus, the Caribbean has Capophycus, Belize has Capophycus. So the entire Caribbean area in many places, we have Capophycus were introduced. So, and some of them has been for the last uh, almost 30 years. So I just wanted to raise the, the, the question, can we work towards some kind of uh, a model or some kind of guidelines that can help to develop to see how we can proceed in terms of introduced species. And specifically in terms of eukumatoids, because they are very economically important uh, crop, as we all know. And I foresee the future for the Caribbean, a very interesting, along with Brazil, we also have a large area, to be uh, an important uh, region for producing of, of, of carragenophytes. And even not only to supply, you know, the Asia or, or or Southeast Asia, or, or but also for our own markets, for our own carotenoids and our that we consume in Latin America, which is huge. Okay, so I just wanted to 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 get some of your feedback from you, some ideas, if there's any way we can uh, start thinking about this to in order to to make this sustainable. So far, we are being success in the last three years, but and then it's, it's weak because sometimes maybe we, we don't have a a, a strong uh, support, so that maybe they can. In a year time, government changes, so, um, um, they say, well, you cannot grow anymore. And then we have already engaged about maybe over a thousand people in Venezuela already working on this, okay? Thanks. So oh, I want to hear from you. That, that is fantastic. Uh, Realities on the ground again. These are what this work is going to need to take into account. And I see that we both uh, have both Mina and Dan who are ready to speak, perhaps to this, perhaps to other things. I'm also going to um, turn to our panelists to prepare you. So Sock asked you questions. Perhaps there's an opportunity for you here to also ask Sock and Flower, who's typing from a bus, uh, on the to get some smallholder perspectives from them while we're here in this conversation. So I'll have you uh, ruminate on that while we turn to Mina. Wonderful, great. And indeed, any standard or any assessment does need that ground truthing. So um, I wanted, if if I may, just um, comment on whether it should be one standard. And if I can, pose a question back to the fellow panelists or to our smallholders in, in, in the chat. So um, just on the um, on whether it should be one one standard or for to to merge, um, and I would say that these standards uh, also having to work having worked for a standard for many years, um, these are market based instruments, right? And different countries, different part of the world, they have different markets and market needs. So for example, one might be very very well known and give you a competitive advantage, which also answers some of the why question in North America, but it will not in Southeast Asia because it's not known or depending on which market. So I think there is still a need. I think more what you're talking about, maybe that's the role of GSSI, which is really something like you have your benchmarking or different coalitions, et cetera, that can endorse and not endorse. But I do think that there needs to be a, a sweep of them. And of course they need to they all need to hold up to a certain standard. Um, and point taken about the NBS, and I said this was an aquaculture project integrated to MPAs from the beginning, and we try to apply it retrospectively to see if fisheries and aquaculture could be uh, a NBS, uh, which leads me the question back to everyone here in the audience is that where uh, the seaweed farming was did not score very high is on the net, uh, well, the biodiversity gain. So I'm wondering, both from kind of on the ground, if you can see some kind of the biodiversity benefits that coming from, you know, some kind of restoration or uh, to any of the, the standards that were presented as panel in terms of what there can be to measure that um, positive, um, well, biodiversity gain. Thanks, thank you so much. Great, so while people are thinking about their answers to that, let's, uh, let's hear from Dan. Thanks, um, yeah, to come back on some of Jerry's Jerry Chopin's questions. Um, so I think when you ask what what is the unit of certification, you're trying to open up a general discussion about 
should it just be the farm because in our standards currently it is at the farm level we've we've set this um uh this unit of certification our own program we have a separate standard for processing plants and um other things which aren't necessarily relevant for seaweed uh, feed mills and hatcheries but um so the unit of certification is the farm um you asked how could we justify the costs to the small producers it's a tough one uh i think the the model will will sink or fall on the on does it deliver value uh, all along the chain and um a lot of these programs are included are market driven and uh we are partly resolving major issues with other types of aquaculture misuse of antibiotics destruction of mangroves um sea lice in salmon farming issues which uh are major concerns and they crop up uh you know as, as headaches for for the retailers and the food service sector and then that opens up this dialogue between the marketplace and the producers and uh, the standards are then uh, set to 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 meet those expectations so um i think this dialogue is is underway obviously with aqua with uh, seaweed and um we have this discussion about well should it be one standard for all should it be a, a string of different ones different species different settings different countries different systems well, I'll just tell you that the trend at the moment is towards merging standards. The ASC, I don't want to take uh, away Mika's uh, discussion points here, but ASC is merging its uh, farm standards into one global piece because, not least, because training auditors on umpteen different systems is tricky um, and expensive. So uh, we've merged standards. We had one for Vangasius, tilapia, shrimp, um and barramundium even they've merged them all together into one farm standard uh so that is the trend global gap likewise they have a farm standard and uh, they don't want to have a separate one for mussels and and um fish and shrimp so that that debate between lumping them together or splitting them is going towards lumping the standards together so uh i just um say the yeah keep this conversation going you need something that adds value you need something that uh can resolve market issues where they are but but be be pleased that seaweed doesn't create the same headaches as other forms of um, fed aquaculture for example thanks dan um i foresee a lively debate on on this and this is exactly why we're having this kind of discussion wanted to flag the flower um from the bus has followed up Raoul, on your question to say is is it the invasive species that uh that stakeholders are afraid of so so that's something that needs to be taken into account whether it's invasiveness or not let's turn to mickey now now, uh, ask Dan to put down your hand. And uh, Mickey, over to you. Thank you, Nicola. Um, so my, um, what I wanted to say was in response to Min Mina's point about um, the biodiversity issue. And um, as part of the, the seaweed standard, um, some of the things that are assessed, I, and I might have touched on this previously, was um, whether there's any impacts on the ecosystem or on um, endangered, threatened, or species or protected species. So um, I think the goal here is to um, to reduce the negative impact of the production unit um, as much as possible. Um, and so, and in addition, um, we also look at um, conditions that have been placed on. Um, on these production units and these conditions have to be closed out before the end of the next, um, before the end of the assessment cycle. And some of the things that um, we do look at um, is waste management and, um, you know, um, making sure that tie ties and other plastic waste is, um, is not, um, is not adding additional uh, marine pollution into the environment. And so we're trying to, re I, th I think the goal here is to reduce the environmental impact and also, um, improve social conditions so um wage and stuff like that so yeah thank you 
thinks that indeed the, the goal at the farm level is, of course, to reduce the, the negative impact and is also, as we've been talking about here, to incentivize farmers to actually do it rather than sort of taking the beat with a stick approach, which um, typically doesn't work. How do we create an incentive structure for smallholders to actually voluntarily uh, chime in, uh, climb in? So over now back to Thierry and encouraging others on this uh, on this this call on this webinar if you have questions we've got about 10 more minutes for the question part so please feel free to tee those up in the chat or to put up your zoom hand Thierry over to you yes uh... Lumping or not lumping, that is a question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was more thinking of what I was saying is instead of having a seaweed standards, and then it looked like every seaweed practices can be treated the same way, we can lump into one big thing, but then we have to make sections. And uh, for example, uh, the, another standards I am involved with is the uh, Organic Aquaculture Standards of Canada. Um, we have done section for that species, you do, 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 do. For that species, you do that, that, that is specific to that species. Oh, section three, four, five can be a repeat of the other one. So C, uh, section one, all these things, you don't need to repeat. Uh, but we need, even if it is in one big file, big standards, I think we need to go more specific than seaweed are treated like that. It's seaweeds and then uh, acuma, uh, porphyra, uh, kelp and we think and then be specific for each level because different uh, species, different countries, the issues are very different. Uh, for example, also I see it, for example, the MSCASC uh, standards spend quite a lot of time on the social aspect versus the GSA. Uh, the social aspect came after because some of us say you have to address it. So and there's nothing wrong, but different region, different species will uh, emphasize different issues. And I think that's what it is. It is we have to be more specific than just seaweed, whatever. And then do we want after that to have several, uh, yeah, it's market driven and all these things, but do we want to have uh, several certification institution to cooperate uh, for that species, that species, or that species. And I know it's all market driven. Uh, and thank you for bringing the Shakespearean dimension to this <laughs> as well. Um, to lump or not to lump, that is the question. Uh, Valeria. Yeah, the, the thing is that today we are exactly in the position where current standards are not allowing us to assess what is going on in our business. So if we start merging standards that are not taking into account the specificities Thierry is talking about, we, we will need to wait 10 years and have a lot, a lot of investment to bring the value chain of tropical red seaweeds to a level where actually it could fit the general seaweed standard if we are indeed merging. And I come back to, to the thing that uh, we don't have concessions. We don't have a regulatory framework. It's really highly informal. So just, just because of that, we cannot choose what is already in the market and what customers are requiring today is perhaps not the certification yet, but at least the commitment that we have long-term roadmaps with our suppliers and their producers to address the challenges that if we, don't not, we do not address collectively, we will never be at the level where actually certification can happen. So I, I do agree with Thierry that, I mean, at this moment, at least for the Kumatoid case, it's, uh, I mean, most of the seaweed farms that are today cer um, through certification of ICMSC are in Korea, South Korea, Japan, and it's not, it's, it's, it's because they have concession and the regulatory framework that allows it. And and uh, thank you. And you're pointing to this important difference that uh, those regulations and standards exist in developed countries. And yet we've heard from SOC that there are millions and millions of smallholders 
in countries that don't have the kind of regulations that you're describing, Valeria. So, Salk, having listened to all of this, I see that nobody's turning back to you with a question. So I'm going to turn back to you with a question. In all of the issues and points that have been raised so far, is there something missing from this discussion? There's been an acknowledgement of the importance of organizing and, and scaling up on the, on the producer side, uh, some differences of opinion, but there's also been a lively debate, the to lump or not to lump. Is there something else that this group needs to be thinking about as they take this work forward? And I'm springing this question on you without preparing you first. So apologies for that. Yes, uh, Nicola, <clears throat> there are, there were two issues I raised in my uh, opening statement. One is uh, how do we how do we uh, incentivize the transition from current monocrop monocrop uh, seaweed culture to polyculture? We discussed uh, one time IMTA. Okay. The integrated multi-tropic aquaculture seems to be uh, a promising practice, a best practice. So if we are coming up with a standard and uh, we want to capture in the standard best practices and we consider IMTA as one of the best practices, should we not put it somewhere in the standard? So that's that's one. So that 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 will uh, institutionalize somehow the incentive toward that polyculture. Uh, number two, uh, I raised the issue of, uh, because the issue uh, in the third party certification, uh, even as we experience in the organic agriculture uh, system, is the cost, very expensive third party. <laughs> uh, so that's why, uh, uh, and and also second is ownership. No, uh, uh, Dan said about it's more top down. No, but uh, uh, that's why we were there. There is this idea of uh, um, participatory guarantee system (PGS) now in the organic, being advocated now by IFOAM and here in the Philippines it has been institutionalized. There's a law. Uh, uh, there's a law which amended the current Organic Agriculture Act, incentivizing GP, uh, PGS. No, um, so so PGS is basically uh, it's it's locally uh, focused quality assurance system, no, which is basically built on trust. Uh, shared learning um, and then uh, uh, you know uh, we, we don't we don't lower the uh, lower the standard but uh, we make use of local stakeholders uh, participation uh, to get together so so that uh, it won't be that costly no so I don't know if we can come up with that also in the uh, something like that in the um, in the uh, seaweed seaweed industry. Yeah, great, thank you. And to add to what you've just said, Flower has noted in the chat the importance of political will, and indeed we see differences in countries that focus on seaweed, that incorporate seaweed into their national development planning and countries that don't or anywhere in between. And that's one of our policy recommendations for those who, who have heard us in the Global Seaweed Coalition. It is important, we feel, for countries to pay attention to seaweed, uh, whether it's incorporating it into the nationally determined contributions, national development plans, improving collection of seaweed data, which is, of course, important also for uh, for certification, etc. Thierry, you're putting up your hand again. Um, so 
I'm going to ask you to keep this one really short, a noting that we have a question in the chat from Rohit about um, whether there's been any conversation about metals and other contaminants. The short answer to that, Rohit, is not directly, but, uh, um, but Thierry, super quick. Yep. Uh, I think with these standards, what we see is exactly the approach that we had with fisheries and with aquaculture. It's one species at a time or one group of organisms at a time. So the shellfish uh, uh, standards, the seaweed standards and all these things. And I very much uh, appreciate what Sock is saying, of course, talking about IMTA. Uh, but then we go into certification of food production system. Yeah. And I don't know if people are uh, at that level yet of discussion, but of course, that's where we should go. What, uh, how to be most efficient in the food production system of the future and IMTA has its place, but then certifying food production system, whoo, that's another level of lumping. <laughs> Yes, yes, it is. That would be Shakespearean, Dickensian, and all of your Ians all, all lumped into all of your literaries all lumped into one. Um, if anybody has a quick answer to Rohit's question, um, please let me know. Otherwise, I think what we could say is Rohit, we, um, we look forward to you uh, seeing the replay because it's about time for us to wrap up, uh, let me see if the, any of our panelists wanted to say a final 30 second, this is your opportunity to say, to have your last minute anything. Going once, oh, here we go. All right, I'm very glad Nada, because you've been hey. you've been watching this conversation. I've been listening, it's, it, it's really, really interesting. Um, <clears throat> now we held in celebration of the international year uh, for, uh, small scale fisheries and aquaculture. Last year, we had a webinar that gathered many people across the globe, more than 200 people that shared uh, practices, case studies, and we had discussions about this specifically, the, the challenges for small, small scale, not uh, seaweed. Uh, there were no examples then, but the challenges and the barriers are uh, the same. So uh, some of the recommendations were uh, there's no um, there's no one there's no solution to every uh, every problem that we have in the equilibrium certification that we're discussing and, and I appreciate the the various uh, comments that were uh, made uh, also that there are limits as we see it in the fish products uh, so we need to learn uh, uh, from this. Um, and also uh, one common um, uh, theme is to put small producers, aquaculture fisheries on a pathway for improvement and recognize uh, the special regional, domestic and local uh, realities. So that, that echoes what more or less everyone shared previously. And that was also a summary from something, some of the discussions that we had uh, ourselves last, last year. Thanks a lot, Nicola. Uh, yeah, you are more than welcome. Uh, so thank you for that. And, and now let's, uh, so this part of the uh, of the webinar is over. Uh, we'll come back to you. Thank all of our speakers a little bit more before, before closing. But now let's turn to my colleague, Vincent Dumézel. Vincent is, um, He's director of the food program at Lloyd's Register Foundation. He is senior advisor, ocean and food at UN Global Compact. He is the author of the book, The Seaweed Revolution, and he's the co-founder of the Global Seaweed Coalition. So Vincent is going to summarize for us and share, share next steps. Vincent, over to you. Thank you very much, Nicola, and uh, congratulations uh, once again for your excellent job in moderating this session. Uh, uh, we are always expecting exceptional things for you, and we are never disappointed. So uh, it's always uh, glad. And thanks very much to Sophia as well, who stayed in the, in, in the shadow, but uh, was really organized and worked very hard to uh, organize this session, actually. Uh, and of course, thanks to all our uh, speakers and our contributors here uh, for, for this. It's a very interesting discussion. Um, I've, I've been working in another life 
previously, I've been working in the certification business for quite some years and contributed to the development of what is now called the Global Food Safety Initiative, uh, which is addressing a lot of the topics that has been discussed today. Uh, typically, if we look at what happened, I mean, the, the, the food is uh, by far the most complex and fragmented business uh, in the world. And, um, and when it was time to develop some standards and certification standards. Of course, a lot of uh, industrial and a lot of private initiatives started first, um, then MSC and some equivalent at least uh, uh, developed their own standards as well. They were at least all based on the Codex Alimentarius, which is a UN, uh, uh, a UN uh, registration for all uh, best practices on food safety. So this is not yet existing uh, for seaweed. So that's think that's something to, to be uh, uh, think of. Uh, I think I think that 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 discussion actually raised we we uh, we entered that discussion with the UNEP trying to um, to define what could be a standard for small holders uh, because uh, they have so much expectation right now and momentum on seaweed that we need to do it right because otherwise we will just be losing this momentum and we will mess it up and we will disappoint everyone uh, if we end up having ethical or environmental issue. And we know that uh, uh, there are some uh, risk around that. So we need to do it right. And we also need to know that the question is not about what we grow, but how we grow it. So we need to grow it right uh, and avoid uh, the problem we have uh, faced in, uh, in, the, in, in the land production, I would say, or in more uh, traditional aquaculture production. So we have a green field or a blue field, we should say. Uh, we can design whatever we want here in terms of uh, uh, landscape. And, and I think this discussion highlighted, uh, and I really appreciated uh, uh, everyone's contribution, Tabi Valeria and, and Thierry's question, which are highly relevant. Uh, we have, we have, uh, we have uh, a lot to develop with a minimal uh, requirement. Uh, possibly, I, I don't think there will be one fit all, and, and we live, live, need to live with different standards and possibly some per region or per, uh, or per species. Uh, but maybe to have some kind of entity, GSSI might be a very relevant one, to benchmark these different standards, recognize them, highlight the difference or the gaps, and, and make sure that they are all together. So all of this, once again, this is just uh, food for thought. Uh, this needs to be discussed. We are a, a member-led organization, so we need to discuss this further. What will be these minimal standards for, for smallholders that should also have a role to guide uh, institution and government in, in how to establish uh, these uh, requirements for the for this nascent industry, how can we monitor uh, the overall thing, uh, the overall standards, which should be something to be developed. Same, uh, the global civil coalition and UNEP would be very relevant to that. Uh, is should we set up something with GS, with GSSI to benchmark these standards to recognize them and so forth, and then the next stage will be uh, as it was mentioned, or how to ensure traceability. How can we uh, leverage on uh, on uh, on this uh, blockchain or AI or whatsoever uh, to enter traceability? And how could we train uh, the farmers to improve? Because as mentioned by uh, Valeria, uh, 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 compliant or not compliant is not uh, that's not the end of the story. Of course, we need to uh, support those who are not compliant. Um, so there's a lot uh, in that Pandora's box that we have opened uh, today, uh, a lot to work on. So uh, I can already announce the second discussion uh, during the first quarter of, uh, of, uh, of 2024. And I think uh, we will need to hear more from the smallholders uh, for those where we want to address. There might be some other discussion on the global architecture of uh, all these uh, standards for the seaweed industry. We should incorporate uh, each and every one here, MSC, Global Gap, and so forth. But but I think uh, focusing and keeping the focus on on uh, on, on these small holders, we need to hear more from them. I think there will be uh, uh, something also during the UN Environmental Assembly uh, at the end of February, uh, organized by UNEP in Nairobi. Uh, Sophia and I will be there with uh, with Leticia's team. All of this, of course, needs to be science driven, as stated by Leticia very important we want to rely on science and avoid the mistakes uh, that uh, were done uh, in some other sector so once again a lot of complexities there's a, a lot of discussion to have might be 
we will launch a, a working group on that, uh, an active working group. Well, the volunteers are welcome. Uh, I can I can perceive some of them here, uh, but uh, we we welcome any uh, any volunteers. Uh, and then uh, this working group will have this kind of open discussion because we need to be transparent and open uh, in that approach. Uh, we don't have a solution. Uh, we all have a solution. Uh, so uh, so that, that's the idea of how it will uh, progress. Once again, great, great discussion. We are right on time, which is quite exceptional uh, <laughs> and show a very good uh, moderation of this uh, debate, Nicola. Uh, so uh, thanks again. I, I leave you the final word. Uh, but but once again, I'm, I'm very uh, happy about this. I think it, it's very well in line with the UNEP report and where the UNEP wants to go. We need to make sure that the growth of the seaweed industry does not impact uh, our environment and, uh, and, and support uh, the best practice in terms of ethics, because we cannot disappoint uh, those uh, level of expectation that have been that have been created over the last months. So we are well, well, uh, well, well progressing on that, uh, and uh, and hope we can uh, continue with this. Thanks again to everyone, and I leave you the final words, Nicola. Uh, thanks very much, Vincent, and indeed. What this discussion has highlighted for me is it's always challenging when you set yourself up to do the best, because the best can sometimes mean that you leave aside good. So um, just a little challenge to the team while you're shooting for the best, because best is great. Also, don't be leaving aside the good. Uh, and that may help to square the circle with some of these difficult challenges. It's time for us to close. So um, Vincent, to add to the thanks that you have delivered uh, on behalf of the Global Seaweed Coalition, huge thanks to each of our panelists for your insightful remarks. It's just been terrific to hear you and to hear the conversation between you. Huge thanks to Leticia for opening this, uh, this webinar. Thanks to all of you in attendance for your engagement, for your interesting questions, for your comments in the chat and for speaking up. That's really important for this conversation. And, and just to underscore what Vincent said, you know, encourage you to volunteer to participate in this important work. Thanks so much to our friends at UNEP for this great collaboration. And we look forward to continuing that. Much appreciated. And uh, last, but by no means least, special thanks to my colleagues in the Global Seaweed Coalition. And in particular, a huge shout out to Sophia for putting this together. Congratulations, Sophia, well done. So finally, a promotional word, couldn't let this go by without doing a little PSA for the Global Seaweed Coalition. If you are not already a member, please join. It's easy, it's easy to join. It's just a few clicks and a few keystrokes from the Global Seaweed Coalition website, and it's free. Becoming a member will give you access to our bi-weekly newsletter, to our member collaboration space, and exclusive members-only access to events. So sign up today. We hope you found this event both useful and enjoyable and that you too are looking forward to joining in developing this important agenda. Thanks very much. Goodbye.